Alrighty. Shalom, shalom, everyone. All right, thank you for joining me. Um, I'm gonna give it a few minutes here and let some people join into the stream and then we will get started with our study. All right, Tiffany, Ken, thanks for joining. Shalom. Looking forward to seeing you guys soon. Right. I said, give it a couple minutes here. And we will sadly, sadly be wrapping up the Psalms of Solomon. Uh, we'll do a little do a little housekeeping stuff here in a few minutes. Like I said, I'm just gonna give it a little bit of time for people to come in. Um tch -tch -tch. And then we'll get going. Oh, yep. Very exciting. Can't wait to see you guys. It's going to be so much fun. Good fellowship. Good fellowship this week. I mean, it, you guys are coming at the end of the week. And then um, doing a fellowship Thursday night with um, Leaving Churchianity. Uh, if you guys didn't know, I posted a, a little video about it. Uh, but this Thursday night, 7 p.m. Central Time, we're going we're gonna to do some fellowship online with... Uh, leaving Churchianity, so that should be a lot of fun. And that is on TikTok, so you guys on YouTube, that'll be restreamed the following night, so it'll be Friday night for you guys. So uh, looking forward to that, though. It's going to be a real good week. Rayleigh, shalom to you and uh, to your wife. Tell her I said hello. Thank you, guys. Um, right, yeah, Luke. Luke's great. I'm a, I really like Luke. He's doing he's doing good stuff for the kingdom. So I can't wait to uh, spend some time. I think we're going to talk about uh, dispensations and some of that stuff. So it's going to be a really good time. I hope you guys can join Thursday night or Friday night if you're on YouTube. Um, looking forward to those shirts. Thank you, Rayleigh. You guys are uh, very kind. That should be really cool. I'll sport them on the live stream after I get them. Claude, shalom. Thanks for joining. Appreciate your emails as well. Um, good to good to talk to you outside of the chat too. All righty. Um, yeah, I think I'll give it like two more minutes. I'm going to give it like two more minutes and then we'll get started in the study and our housekeeping stuff, if you will. Um... Anything else? You guys you guys want to chat for a couple minutes while we wait for some people to join into the stream? Anything on your mind? On your heart? Um, anything at all? Good time to chat before the stream. All right. Oh. All right, well, I guess no news is good news, so... Uh, Glad to hear it or not hear it, I guess. Alrighty. Um, wow, when you guys aren't talking, two minutes is a really long time. <laughs> I'm just gonna just throwing that out there. It seems like it's been two minutes and it's been like thirty seconds, I, if even. I don't even know if it's been that long. I start timing that stuff. Tammy, shalom. Thanks for joining. Glad you could be here. Um. It's sad, sad that we're going to wrap up Psalms of Solomon tonight. Um, but I'm going to announce our next study here in a couple minutes during the housekeeping stuff. Um, I think you guys are going to like the next study. I know I will. Alrighty. I'm going to wait till 7.05. So I'll give it, give it one more minute here. Oh, yeah, Tiffany, you just hold on one more minute and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you guys. Um, I thought a lot about what I wanted to do next uh, for our our studies. I know after Revelation on Shabbat, we're doing Isaiah. So we're going to go through Isaiah right after we wrap up Revelation. And I was like, well, what do I want to do after Psalms of Solomon? Um, ooh, it was 705. All right, good. Housekeeping stuff. So uh, I, I thought a lot about a study I wanted to do. And it's one I recommend to people all the time. But I don't know if you guys are actually reading it or not. I know some of you are, but um, I don't know if all of you are. And this is this is a, a first century Christian writing. 
technically second century Christian writing, uh, early, early Christian or early second century Christian writing. Um, it, it's the shepherd of Hermas. That is what I landed on for us studying next. Uh, it is a book. I think every single Bible believer should read and understand and acknowledge. Um, I've done short videos on it from my tales from the Apocrypha and I mention it a lot, but I haven't done any actual studies on it, at least not online. When we were doing Sukkot this last year, we went through a good chunk of the Shepherd of Hermes um, during that, uh, but we weren't able to finish it, and I didn't start from the very beginning because the Shepherd of Hermes is a really long book, so we might be in this one for a while, only doing you know, like an hour, hour and a half once a week. We might, we might not make a whole lot of headway. We could be in it for a long time. I don't know. Um, the book's kind of divided up into three sections. The first section is like all the um, parables, visions. Um, it's not as good. I like the first section of the book and there's a lot of spiritual meaning in it. But the second section of the book is where it gets really, really meaty, like stuff that we need to know and understand for our Christian walk. Oh my goodness. Child, you scared me. Oh, you guys, my door just busted open. It was like someone kicked it down. I guess it didn't latch all the way. Were you leaning up against the door? Man, that scared dead dad. Come here. Come here. Come say hi to everybody. My assistant busted my door down. All right. Come say hi to everybody. Say hi. We love you. We love you. You kicking doors down, scaring dad, dad. Jeez. Child. Yeah. I don't kick your door down. Yeah. That would scare you. <laughs> yeah. Do you tell, you, can you smile for everybody? Hey, say hi to Tammy. And Tiffany. Say hi. Aww. Oh, my little sister. He's so cute. He's so cute. All right. Can you go back to mom? Yeah. <laughs> that was definitely a no. I don't know if you guys caught that. She's like, no. You want to stay with dad, dad? Yeah. All right. If you stay in here, you have to not be disruptive. I know you're hard at that. Hard at, yeah. hard, hard at that. Hard for you not to do that. There we go. <laughs> you want to be disruptive? A little disruptive, baby. Okay, here. Take your bubba. All right. Here. No, no. Take your toy. All right. Go to mom. Go on. Go back to mommy. Good girl. All right. Hold on. I need to close my door and actually make sure it's closed. Yeah. Daisy, you can stay. Come on, I clearly need to adjust the hinges on that door. Anyways, all right. So we're gonna do the Shepherd of Hermes. Uh, the second section of the book is where it gets really meaty. Um, but it is, a, it, it's a big, big book. I mean, it's, so we'll be reading it out of this one too. If you guys wanna pick up your copy, I really suggest you get this. This is a, a really solid translation for a lot of first century Christian writings. Um, it's The Apostolic Fathers by Rick Brannon. Um, let's see if by Rick Brannon, you can get it on Amazon for like, I, I think not even 10 bucks. Um, it's really good, but the Shepherd Hermes is, uh, I mean, it's a pretty much most of the back half that like, that's all the Shepherd Hermes. That's like, it's big. I don't even know how many chapters there are. Um, there's a, there's a lot, three, there's five, there's 12. Um, man, I, yeah, there's a lot. Let's just, we can leave it at that. There's a lot of chapters in this book. Anyways, we're going to be in it for a while. Um, might take some breaks here and there to cover some short stuff, but at the end of the day, this is a book that if you haven't already read it, you should read it. And if you have read it, you should read it again. Uh, it's a really, really good one. So we're going to, we're going to do that. And we're probably going to be in that for a hot minute or two. So anyways, we will begin that next week on Tuesday on TikTok. And for you guys on YouTube, you know the deal. It'll be on Wednesday. Um, and then again, 
Housekeeping, we already talked about it, but I'll be doing a live stream with Leaving Churchianity this Thursday night, 7 p.m. Central, on TikTok. Then I'll restream it Friday on my YouTube, so uh, you guys can catch it there. If you miss it, uh, it's going to be a good time. It's going to be a really good time, and then we are still going through Revelation on Shabbat. So, got a full docket this week, a lot to do. Uh, lots of good stuff though. Can't wait to uh, can't wait to do it. Honestly. Um, anyways, I am going to get into the study now. Uh, could you repeat that, please? When? Okay. Um, leaving the live stream with leaving Churchianity, Luke. Uh, that's going to be Thursday night on TikTok at 7 p.m. Central Time, and then on YouTube it will be Wednesday at 7 p.m. Central. No, Friday. Oh my goodness. This study is going to be Wednesday on YouTube, 7 p.m. Central, but it'll get restreamed on my YouTube uh, Friday, 7 p.m. And it'll be there. So you guys can go back and watch it if you if you want to and, and you miss it. So anyways, if you don't already follow Luke, I highly suggest you do it. Uh, really, really good uh, Tor Observant ministry that he's doing. Um, so definitely go support Luke. I don't think he's on YouTube for you guys, so I'm sorry about that. Um, I'll confirm that with him on uh, on t or Thursday. Yeah, Thursday. Uh, but I don't think he's on YouTube. I'm pretty sure it's only TikTok. And then I know he has a podcast he's working on. We can talk about that more too. Get all the deets for you guys to follow him if you don't. But on TikTok for sure, follow him, Leaving Churchianity. Uh, really good ministry to follow. He's still pumping out a lot of good short studies, which I have not had a whole lot of time to do. So um, follow him for sure. Anyways, uh, we are going to wrap up the Psalm of Solomon tonight. Super sad, uh, super, super sad. Um, but it's been a good journey through this book. And chapter 18, in, I think um, 17 and 18 are really the two that so obviously point to Yeshua. Uh, they're my favorite chapters in this, although all of it's been really, really good. Um, but anyways, we'll get into it and, um, yeah, can't wait. I'm sad we're wrapping it up, but thank you guys for going through this whole study with me. It's been a blessing. I hope you guys have gotten as much out of it as, as I have. Um, and we'll get, we'll get started in it. And, uh, Tiffany, yes, uh, bless him indeed. He does deal with a lot of the, the mainstreamers. Um, it's honestly, it's one of those things where the more stuff you put out, at least short stuff on TikTok, the more you have to deal with it. And man, I've been going through it for years. Um, honestly, it's been kind of a nice break for me not doing as many short studies just because I don't have to deal with as much of that on a day to day basis. I still get it, but not to the extent when you're putting out one, two, three videos a day, um, it can get hectic in the comments and it can get just honestly draining. It can get really, really draining if you actually keep up on those comments, which I know Luke does and so did I, so do I. Uh, and it can get really hard if you're actually engaging in the comments to try to help people. Most of what you're getting, people don't want help. They want to just kill, steal, and destroy, you know? So, uh, but yeah, he has to deal with a lot of that and he's, he's doing a great job of it. So anyways, um, let me see here. What do we got? Um, it was the same way. Yeah. Ooh, it was really, really bad. It was really bad on my, on my channel when I was able to put out, you know, two, three videos a day. Um, I had to do a lot, a lot. Uh, like I said, I still get it. Uh, anybody that puts any type of content like this out on the internet for people is going to get it at some point. Uh, but the more you put out there, the more you're going to get. It's like, you know, it just is what it is. But <clears throat> there's still very much a need for that. There's still people waking up. There's still people coming to the truth. And it's very good um, that there are people out there still doing this, still putting up with all of it. And you know, doing it for free, you know, um, again, I, you, you guys know how I am with the tithing and with monetization. I, I don't think, at least if you have any other means to support yourself, I don't think you should be seeking to make money off of ministry work. I think this is our service. This is what we are supposed to do. 
Um, but you know, you're, you're putting in your time, your free time away from your family, away from your hobbies, away from your job, away from literally anything else in your life. And it get really hard when you're doing that and all you're getting is just hate, 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 hate. It definitely drags on you in it. Like I, I noticed the cycle though. Like I've seen a whole lot of people come in after me doing the same type of stuff, same type of ministry work. And it seems almost like we all kind of go through the same cycle. You know, we're all super gung ho. We're like, oh, people are going to respond to this. People want the truth. And then, then it, it just, we get attacked and attacked and then you get angrier and angrier and angrier. And then you take a little break and then you come back and you're like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm doing this for, for the most time doing this for Yeshua. And they never said it was going to be easy. In fact, they said it was going to be really, really, really hard. And then I think you get to a point where you come down and you're like, okay, some people, some people just don't want to, and I hate to put it this way, but it's like some people just don't want to be saved. You know, they, they don't want the truth. They don't want to listen to reason. They, they just don't want any part of it. And there's nothing you can do, you know, and sometimes you have to reach that point where you realize that as much as you want to help everybody in the world, they don't want it. And they're, you can't force it on them, you know, like you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Same concept. I cannot make these people drink. I cannot make these people obey the commandments. And no matter how much evidence I give them, sometimes and most of the time, they just don't care. They just put on the blinders and they say, nope, I'm good. I, I have my beliefs. I have, have this, have whatever. You're wrong. You're false. You're a liar. You're false. Blah, blah, blah. You know, the usual song and dance, but it does get to a point when you're doing this work where I think you kind of level out and you're like, okay, well, I just understand that, you know, the world hated Yeshua before it hated me and it is what it is. I'm going to keep doing this. Um, and you know, every once in a while you get to see a seed grow and, um, it means the world to me when, you know, someone comes out of the woodwork and said, Hey, uh, you know, I'm that guy two years ago that, that was giving you a bunch of crap. I'm really sorry about that. I, I did what you told me to do. I looked into it. I, I studied the Bible objectively and you know what? You're right. We do need to obey God. That never went away. So that does happen every once in a while. And it makes all of the hate that you get so worth it, at least for me. Um, you know, like I said, it doesn't happen that often. And I'm sure a lot of people have, you know, had a seed planted that grew and they didn't come back and tell me or whatever. And maybe I was just one of many people planting seeds. I, I don't know. But at the end of the day, you never know who you're going to help, who you're going to affect in a positive way. And, um, you know, I, I, I talk about this a lot too. Like, my testimony that I talked to you guys about, like the reason I started going to this church, Christian church in the first place is because of my bank teller. He was just a nice, genuine person planting seeds, again, albeit seeds that I now know are, are rooted in error, but uh, it's that's where you got to start. You know, that that's where almost all of us end up starting our journey with Yeshua and the Most High is in mainstream Christianity. And I think it's those who, who dig deeper, who peel away the layers, who are really, truly studying to show themselves approved, who are truly seeking the will of the Most High in the footsteps of Messiah Yeshua. It's those people who end up coming to the truth. But a lot of people are just content with the mainstream doctrine. It's easy. Uh, it's very, very easy. And people like easy. Like, let's not kid ourselves. We all like easy. So some people are just content with that and they never move forward. They never keep seeking. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it was that person that planted seeds and you know, I told him that seed grew, but he would have never known, you know, if I hadn't gone back and told him, but it was just doing things like that, you know, planting the seed and then occasionally you see it grow. Probably most of the time you don't, but it's definitely worth it. Uh, all the hate you get when you get to see that seed grow. So for whatever that's worth, you know, um, it is our service. It is literally the least we can do in service to the Most High is to try and plant seeds and pray that they grow. And, you know, I've told you guys 
there are many different parts of a body and they all have different functions. And um, that's why, you know, we're not all called to do the same thing. So I don't want you to feel bad, like, you know, if you don't have a, a you know, TikTok, YouTube, online ministry, maybe that's not your calling and that's okay, you know. Uh, again, there's a reason we're described as a body, many different parts to a body, many different functions, but they all have to be working together in order for the body to work, you know. So it, it may not be like online ministry it, it, that you were called to, and that's totally fine. But whatever you're doing for the kingdom, do it, you know, do it to the best of your ability uh, and glorify the most high with it, you know, whether that be hospitality, whether whether you're just, a, you know, a godly wife taking care of your, your husband and your kids. I mean, you have no idea what a godly service that is. Um, speaking as somebody with a godly wife taking care of my family, it's such a blessing and she's doing what she was called to do, you know, and, and that's her thing. And Maybe some of you are called into ministry work online. Maybe some of you are called into the field. Maybe some of you just bump into somebody at Walmart and, and talk about the truth with them. I don't know. We all have different functions. So don't feel bad if you're not like online or something, you know, doing ministry work. This isn't for everybody. And it takes some seriously thick skin. Um, it will it will beat your soul out of your body and you'll give up real quick if you don't have super thick skin. Because uh, the hate is unreal. But, um, again, don't feel bad if you're not up on here doing exactly what I'm doing. This isn't this isn't what everybody was called to do. It's what I was called to do. It might not be what you're called to do. And that's fine. It's totally okay. Um, anyways, I'm off on my tangent. I'm sorry. But, yes, I'm glad you guys support Luke. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Pale Feathers, yours is teaching kids. Exactly. That's great. And see... I think I can teach my own kids, but, you know, teaching other people's kids, not really, not really my thing. Unless you put them up in front of these studies and make them watch that. Then I guess in some way, shape, or form, I'm teaching kids. But definitely not the same as what you're doing. I'm positive of that. So um, do not let anyone judge you in anything. I'm into that. Exactly. Um, it's really a them problem when they hate what you're putting out, you know. You're doing what you were called to do. It's, um, I always, I always forget. I think it's in Isaiah. It could be in Jeremiah, but that, uh, that part where someone needs to go for the most high. And he says, here I am, Lord, send me, you know, it's, we're supposed to do it for him, whatever it is, whatever it is. And if anybody else doesn't like that, well, that's between them and him. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Don't worry about it. And I think, especially online, it takes a while for us to understand that. I know it took me a long time of doing this till I understood that, that it, it was a them problem. And that's going to be between them and God. It's it's not really, it's, it's not really on me. You know, it's, I'm doing what it tells me to do in Ezekiel 33. You know, I'm, I'm sounding the horn saying, hey, danger, danger. You're not doing what God asked. And if they don't listen, it's between them and God. You know, but I did what I was supposed to do. Now, Ezekiel uh, 33 is a really good one for that, if you're curious. Um, we are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Oh, man. Exactly. Um, and yeah, you never know what seed you're planting. Exactly. Exactly. Um yeah, the world hated Christ when he walked the earth and now they hate believers. I, yeah, I, I literally could not agree with you more. Um, yeah, uh, Jen, thank you for that. Ezekiel 2.7, you must speak my words to them, whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious. Exactly, exactly. We're supposed to speak the words to them, whether they listen or not. That way... I, you know, honestly, uh, I, I think it also has to do with judgment. You know, that way, no, no one can play the ignorance card. No one can say, oh, hey, no one ever told me that. And I, now I was never taught that. It was, you know, like, um, they're supposed to hear and everyone's going to be accountable on judgment day and um, people aren't going to like it, but you're not going to be able to play the ignorance card. You're just not. 
I mean, the Bible's so clear that we can't play the ignorance card on Judgment Day. And the Most High is sending people out to speak his word. On a daily basis, there are thousands of people all over the world speaking the truth, the actual truth of his word. And some people are listening and most aren't. Yeshua did, after all, say that the path was narrow and few there'd be that find it. And he said, many are called, but few are chosen. I want to be in the few. I hope you guys do too. Uh, very few want the truth. Yeah, they all want the tickled ears. You're right. They just want, they just want, mm, this feels good. This sounds good. I like that. That's what they want, you know, and it's really sad um, because it doesn't take that much to, to start walking in obedience to the most high, uh, uh, like at least in regards to the things that lead to death. It does not take that much from us. It really doesn't. I truly understand what the most high said in Deuteronomy 30 when he's like, my commandments are easy. Like you do not have to go across the ocean. You you don't have to go up into heaven. You know, they're, they're close to you. They're near to you. They're in your heart. They're in your mouth so that you can do them. Um, I really understand that now trying to keep the commandments, you know, um, it's not impossible. Everybody makes it impossible because that, that just further justifies the ear itching. You know, if it's impossible to keep the most highest commandments, then, you know, we don't have to, obviously we don't have, Jesus paid for it all. He paid for it all. So, um, that, and it's a doctrine that everybody loves just tickling those ears. Um, all right. Let's see here. Missed a bunch more. Uh, Tinkerbell. Yeah. They really like the, all you got to do is believe doctrine. They sure do. They sure do. And it's extremely sad. Um, you wouldn't believe some of the stuff I've heard from people that believe that. Like, just, like, I just can't believe that they believe that. You know, like, hearing some of the things that people have said to me because of the doctrine they believe, I'm like, like, I know you're, I know you're not like a special needs person. I know your brain works just fine. I know you can read. I know you can comprehend. How can you possibly believe the stuff you're saying and believing in when there, especially when there is a mountain of scriptural evidence that proves it completely wrong? Uh, I, I just, it, it just dumbfounds me. Some of the stuff that I hear from people, I'm like, how could you possibly believe that? Like, how did you get so duped into believing that? I mean, it's unreal. It's unreal. The completely unbiblical stuff that people have chosen to believe, contrary to all the evidence. Don't get it. Ignorance is no defense of the law. Exactly. Uh, exactly. You can't play that one in a human court of law. You think you're going to be able to play it with God who knows everything? Good luck. Um, yeah. Oh, well. They all have to make their own choices. Um, what would you say your denomination is? I, I've talked a lot about this. I've made videos about this. I mean, if you want to label it, you could say I'm a Torah observant Christian. You could say I'm a Messianic Jew. Um... At the end of the day, I honestly prefer not to have a denomination. Whenever people create denominations, it, it always gets put into a box. It, it says, oh, well, we all believe this. We can't believe this. And this is your parameter. You can't go too far outside of that. And I just I just don't believe that anymore. Um, I, I it, The Bible is about a relationship with our creator and our Messiah that our creator sent to us. It's it's about a relationship. It's not about a religion. And when you denominate something, you're saying, this is my religion, this is my set of beliefs. And I just think it's wrong. And I think that's what leads to a lot of the errors that we have nowadays. I mean, there's, at last count, there was over 30,000 denominations of Christianity. And when you label what I believe, well, now we're 30,000 in one. You know, and it's not the case. What I believe is what the Bible says. I read it from the front to the back. I do my best to do what it says. I do my best to not make up man-made excuses to make my doctrine work. 
And, and I obey God. I try to walk in the footsteps of my Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he says, do this. And I try my best to do it. It's, he's real. They're real. This is the instructions that they left me. And that is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to have a relationship with my creator and a relationship with my Messiah and do what they have asked me to do to the best of my ability. I believe the whole Bible is true and applicable and we need to be doing it. If you want to claim to believe in the God of the Bible, you need to believe all of the Bible, not just the parts you like. And this is why we get denominations. Oh, I like this part, but I don't like this part. This part's cool and this part's cool, but not really these parts. Oh, I don't, I think none of this applies. And then now you have a denomination and then somebody else comes along and says, you know what? I like that, but I don't like this, this, and this. And now you have another denomination. And then this group, oh, I like that, that, and that. But I think but I like this too, but you don't have that. So we're going to be here. And it's just, it just spirals out of control. There's one way to serve God. That's it. There's one way. And the Bible tells you. The Bible tells you how to do that. And, and, and you can boil it down to Ecclesiastes 12, 13. The whole duty of man to fear God and keep his commandments. And Yeshua showed us how to do that properly. How to do that in a way that's pleasing to the Most High. Because everybody else failed. There were people that got close. Really close. Spitting distance close. But everybody still failed. Except Yeshua, which is why he is our plumb line. He is the line of righteousness to which we will all be measured. He is the goal of righteousness. So I read the Bible. I don't make excuses why I, you know, why this doesn't apply to me or why I shouldn't believe this anymore. And I read it all, try to understand it, and I try to do it. So I don't think that's a, dom a denomination. I think that is a relationship. God says, if you want to show me love, this is how you do it. 1 John 5, 2 through 3. We know that we love the children of God and love God when we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. So he said, this is how you love me. And only the people that love me are going to come into my kingdom. So that's what I try to do. I don't, I don't pick and choose. There's stuff in the Bible that I'm not particularly fond of. It is what it is. I'm not God. But I believe it and I accept all of it, whether I like it or not, because it's his choice how we serve him. And if you don't do it how he asked, then you're not doing it. And you can read so many examples in the scripture of people doing just that, making up their own way to serve him or completely ignoring how he said to serve him. And how did it go for them? How did it go for them? Uh, what has been done is what will be done. There's nothing new under the sun. Everybody wants to make up their own way to serve God despite what he says. And I don't think we should do that. I'm not saying I'm perfect at it. I'm not saying there's not room for growth. There certainly is. But at the end of the day, at least I can acknowledge what God says. And I can believe it. And I can place faith on it. And again, whether I like it or not, he is God. He is the most high. He created all. All of this, he gets to say so. You know, when you're God, you get to say so, but you're not God. So uh, unless he gives you the opportunity to say so, and he is not to any of you or me, it is what it is. You either, I mean, it's Yah's way or the highway. And most people are choosing the highway and they just don't realize it. They're, they're being perfect examples of Titus 1.16. The people honor me with their mouth. I'm sorry, that's Matthew 15, 8 through 9. I don't know why I keep getting those mixed up. But that one too. Perfect examples of Matthew 15, 8 through 9. The people honor me with their, their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. And then Titus 1, 16. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable and disobedient, unfit for good works. So that's my denomination. But I don't really like to call it that. And I don't think it is that. I just want a relationship with my creator. I want to do what he asks, and I understand wholeheartedly that I don't deserve what he has waiting in the, le the next life for me. And if I get there, if I get there, it will only be by his grace and mercy and by the blood of Yeshua. No way I'm getting in without that. But that's a really bad excuse to not obey him, especially considering what the Bible says about that. So anyways, there it is, my long-winded answer. 
Um, yeah, how'd that work for the Nicolaitans? Not well. Not well at all. All right. Have, I've had enough rambling. Let's, let's get into our study. All right. For those of you following along, we'll be in the Lexham Septuagint, Psalms of Solomon, chapter 18. All right. Lord, your mercy is upon the works of your hands for eternity. And I, I like it when it points this out. Let's be clear about something. When, when you do what God asks, the whole Bible says that you are righteous. That's what makes you righteous, doing what God asked. You can read that in Ezekiel 18. You can read that in Deuteronomy chapter 6. You can even read about it in Romans 6 or Psalm 19 or Psalm or Isaiah 51. Uh, many other places, many other places. But those are just some of the places that you can read that doing what God asked is righteousness. But let's be clear about this because nobody seems to understand this. We are doing God's righteousness when we obey his commandments. It's his righteousness. So if I am being deemed righteous, it's because I am doing his righteousness. Your own righteousness, every time in scripture, is going against what God asked. Doing your own righteousness means ignoring his righteousness. You can read about that in Ezekiel 18 as well and a couple of other places. I have I have videos about this on TikTok and YouTube. Just type in, you know, on YouTube, oh, your own righteousness, Sheepdog Ministries, and I'm sure one of them will pop up for you. But it's your righteousness because you are ignoring what God said. So all these people that say, oh, you're seeking your own righteousness by obeying God, they're, they're ignorant and foolish. They don't know what the scriptures say. And again, I'm not trying to be mean. This is scriptural fact. This is not my opinion. If you are righteous, it's because you're doing God's righteousness. That's his righteousness. Obeying him is his righteousness. If you ignore what God says, that is seeking your own righteousness. You're saying, oh, you know what? God's righteousness, that's cool and all, whatever. But I'm going to be righteous by doing this, my own thing. And that's exactly what Jesus mentions in Matthew chapter 7 when he's turning people away from the kingdom. He, those people were not doing stuff that God asked them to do. And he says it twice. He says he's turning them away because they're not doing the will of his father. And then he says it again because they're lawless. Seeking your own righteousness means disobeying God. Fact. Biblical fact. Not my opinion. Yep. Read your Bible if you don't believe me. In fact, I very much encourage you to read your Bible either way. But just saying, so when we're seeking righteousness, we need to be seeking his righteousness, which he defines by his laws and right rulings. Please understand that concept. It will, it will serve you well in your, your biblical Christian walk. Guarantee it. But Lord, your mercy is upon the works of your hands for eternity. His righteousness, his works. That's what we are seeking. Your goodness upon Israel with a rich gift. Your eyes looking down upon them and none of them will lack anything. See, that's what we have waiting for us. Lacking nothing. Wipe away every tear. Just honestly, I've tried to picture the kingdom of God a lot. I've tried, I've spent so much time trying to picture it. And just every way I picture it, it ends up getting ruined by humans. It, and, you know, I know it's not going to be that way in the kingdom, but I think we as a species of people can't comprehend things that we can't see, you know? And there's no scenario that has been on earth where people didn't ruin everything. So that's probably why it's hard for me, but... I told you guys my testimony last Shabbat, for those of you that saw it, and that snapshot of what I felt, that just pure love, forgiveness, in a way that's indescribable, that is what I try to picture, and it's just incredible. It, like, like I said, I just got the tiniest snapshot of what's waiting for us, and it's incomprehensible. 
Uh, I literally, there's no way for me to describe to you what I felt. But it was perfect. It was perfect. And there's no world right now that exists like that. So it's hard for me to picture it. But I know that it is going to be amazing. And I know it's going to be worth all the crap that we have to put up with in order to, to plant these seeds that the Most High asked us to plant. It is, it is going to be worth that times a bazillion. And this is why I just can't fathom why people would give that up for something as dumb as breaking Sabbath when you don't need to or breaking the dietary laws when you don't need to. Both commandments that God said leads to death. Two very, very easy commandments to follow and people just won't do it. And they have no idea how they are gambling on that. Because God said what he said. And I believe him. I know that none of us deserves to be there. Right? I, I know that. But at the end of the day, there are people doing things that he said, for sure you won't be there if you do that. And again, I'm not anyone's judge. I don't know who is and isn't getting into the kingdom. I don't know if I'm going to be there. I really don't know if I'm going to be there. But I certainly want to do my best to be there. So when God says keep Sabbath, I try to keep Sabbath. When God says don't eat these gross animals, I try not to eat those gross animals. You know, because they're very important to God. Whether they're important to us or not does not matter. He Again, he's God. He gets to pick what's important to him and what will and will not enter his kingdom. And he told us in the book, he told us what will and will not enter his kingdom and his presence. And I want to enter his presence. And I don't want to throw that away for something as stupid as the dietary laws or Sabbath. And do you have any idea how dumb it would be to throw away what's waiting for us because of bacon? That's so dumb. It's incomprehensibly dumb. And I just don't want anybody to give up their chance in the kingdom for something that's very easy to follow. Very easy to follow. I know they sneak stuff into our food, but I know the Most High is not holding that against us. That is what grace is for. You're trying, but you don't realize. You don't realize what they're doing behind the scenes. That's what grace is for. Grace isn't for, this is my Sabbath, you shall keep it holy, and me going, yeah, that's cool, but I really want to go to this football game and spend a bunch of money on, on food and you know foam fingers and whatever. That's not what grace is for. And if you're trying to play that card, good luck. Yeshua ain't going to pay for it. He said he's not going to pay for it. Hebrews 10. Scripture. Not my opinion. So anyways, let's keep going. Um, your ears hear the entreaty of the poor in hope. Your judgments are upon the earth with mercy. And your love is upon the seed of Abraham, the sons of Israel. Your discipline is upon us like a firstborn, unique son. I wonder who that firstborn, unique son is. It's Yeshua. But all over scripture, especially in Psalms of Solomon, Proverbs, even in Revelation, he punishes those whom he loves. He's trying to correct us. Like you're spanking your kid. Like, hey, don't do this. If you, if you keep doing this, one day you're going to wind up in jail or you're going to wind up doing something that could get you killed. Same thing. He punishes us and corrects us to get us back on the right path, that narrow, narrow path. His correction is upon us. And it sucks, but it's a good thing, even if we don't understand it. And most of us don't. Let's be clear about that. And again, the sons of Israel... I have, I have covered this so many times. I know I'm beating, beating a horse here um, for those of you guys that are always with me. But for anybody new watching here, Israel is, is anybody. It can be anybody. In Matthew 3, John the Baptist said God can raise up stones for his people. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says that you were separated from the commonwealth of Israel and their, their covenants. But now because of the blood of Christ, you've been brought near. Romans 9 through 11 talks all about us getting grafted in. And you don't even need Romans 9 through 11 or anything Paul says. The Old Testament talks about the Gentiles getting grafted into the covenants of Israel. 
all over. And it makes no distinction about their bloodline or their skin color or anything else for that matter. Anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Now, there may be different layers of people. You're going to have kings and priests, and then you're going to have the least in the kingdom. But that, too, to some extent, is in your power to choose. Yeshua tells us those who break the least of the commandments will be least in the kingdom. But those who do them and teach them will be greatest in the kingdom. Don't you want to be the greatest? Don't you want to do them and teach them? Again, you don't have to get up online to teach them. You can teach them to your kids. You can teach them to your neighbor. You can teach them to the old lady that's checking you out at Walmart. You know, you can teach them to anybody, right? But he said the ones breaking the big ones won't be there. He said that in Matthew chapter 7. So in Matthew chapter 13 and a lot of other places. But the least of the commandments, right? So, I mean, to some extent, it is in your power to choose how high up the ladder you want to be in eternity. Now, don't, don't get too, uh, don't get, I don't really know how to say it properly, but uh, don't jump the gun with that thought. You're like, oh, I'm going to be in the kingdom for sure. I'm there. Like, humble yourself. You don't deserve to be there. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. I, I don't care if you have gone to every country on earth and spread the gospel to every single nation of people. Like, I don't care what you've done. You don't deserve to be there. You don't. None of us do. And Paul didn't even act like he was going to be there. He said in 1 Corinthians 4, I have not been acquitted yet. It's the Lord who judges me. I'm not going to pronounce judgment before the time, and neither should you. Right? So, yeah, don't be prideful. Don't be arrogant. Be humble, because none of us deserves it. That is plainly obvious. None of us deserves Yeshua's sacrifice. None of us deserves to be in the kingdom of God. So don't, don't go too far with that, right? I do believe you can have assurance of salvation. I do. However, you probably shouldn't run around acting like it's already done and Yeshua put a crown on your head and open up those gates to you because that has not happened yet. And a lot of really good biblical people have fallen. You can fall. Again, read Ezekiel 18. If a righteous man turns from his righteousness and does what is wicked, he's going to pay for that big time. So um, anyways, uh, Israel can be anyone despite popular doctrines online. Um, and I, I know why some people believe what they believe, but they have to ignore a lot of stuff in scripture. Uh, Old and New Testament, you know, we, you have to ignore a lot. The Most High definitely dispersed Israel into all the other nations. He's going to collect his people from all the other nations. Every tribe, tongue, and color of skin is going to be there worshiping him. It says it in the book. Not my opinion. So anybody telling you that only this race of people, only this skin color, only this bloodline is going to get into the kingdom of heaven, they don't know their Bible very well. I'm sorry, but all over it, all the New Testament, it, it tells people that they're going to be grafted in. Remember, it start all the way back in Genesis with Abraham. You can see that. All nations of the world will be blessed because of you. All nations. Right? And then when Yeshua told the disciples to go out telling all the nations what he commanded them, what, what did he say? Go to all nations. He didn't say, go to this group of people. Go to that group of people. Make sure they only have this skin color. Sorry, but anybody that's preaching that doesn't know their Bible. They don't. And you have to ignore a lot, a lot of scripture in order to say stuff like that. So, again, that's where I'm at with that. Anyone can be Israel, and I'm getting that from scripture, not opinion. So let's keep going. Um, verse five. Um, to return is upon us like a firstborn unique son. Uh, oh, I, I crossed them. Sorry, my bad. Verse five. To, to return an obedient soul from rudeness and arrogance. And that was talking about discipline in case you didn't catch that jump from scripture. The discipline is 
there to return an obedient soul from rudeness in arrogance. May God cleanse Israel for the day of mercy with blessing for the day of election when the bringing up uh, when he brings up his anointed one. Who is that? Let's read this one more time. May God cleanse Israel for the day of mercy with blessing for the day of election when he brings up his anointed one. Boom. Zero question that's talking about Yeshua. And if you guys haven't watched these videos that I have done, I, I really want you to do that. They're all pretty short. I think they're all like three to five minutes long. There's four of them. Uh, it's, you can easily find them on YouTube. It's how Christ fulfilled the law of marriage, um, how Christ fulfilled the law of the priest daughter, how Christ, um, fulfilled the law of cleansing a house. And then, uh, how Christ fulfilled, uh, the law of jealousy. You really need to go watch those. Um, again, I don't care about my watch numbers on TikTok or YouTube. I could, I could give a hoot about that. Those videos, the information that is in those is something I think all of you need to know. If you haven't watched those, please go watch them. It'll take 20 minutes of your life or less to go watch all of those on YouTube or on TikTok. They should all, if you're on TikTok, it's a lot harder to find my videos. But if you're on TikTok, you should be able to go to my Messiah playlist and at some point you'll find them in there. Uh, but it's easier to find them on YouTube because you can actually search for a title. So if you just search Sheepdog Ministries, Christ Fulfilled, they should all four pop up in theory. Um, but especially, especially watch the one about how Christ fulfilled the law of marriage um, and then how, or law of divorce, to the law of marriage or law of divorce, I can't remember, but it's one of those. And then how Christ fulfilled the law of cleansing a house because this is exactly what Christ did for us. And there's a mountain of scriptural evidence how he actually cleansed the house of Israel. And this is a disconnect that people don't understand. I was just tagged in a video from a, a, a woman made who's been a longtime follower of mine, actually. Um, but she's going down a bad road, like questioning, questioning Yeshua in Jesus in the, in the Bible, like that he's actually the Messiah, what he did for us. And when I say Christ paid for your sins, and, and when a lot of people say Christ paid for your sins, there, there seems to be, again, a huge misunderstanding of what is actually going on with that. It's, it's off, I, and I, I'm guilty of this too, describing it as him paying a bill for something that we have done. But, and, and that is kind of what he's doing in a sense, but what he's really doing is for the house of Israel. He's not, this isn't like you going and cheating on your husband and Christ paying for that. We're, we're not talking about stuff like that. Uh, he paid the penalty for the house of Israel because of what they did and what led to them being kicked out of the covenant. He paid those fines. It's not like he's just paying every single fine for every single thing that you do that's not how that works. He paid for the punishment, the penalty that was due to the house of Israel so that we could be brought back into covenant as Israel and not have to pay those fines. And they are heavy, heavy fines that he most certainly paid. But he cleansed the house of Israel and there's scriptural proof for that. I want you to go watch that video. And... He paid for the sins of Israel through the law of jealousy, through the law of divorce. He paid for those sins so that the house of Israel could be brought back into covenant with God. And because the house of Israel can be brought back into covenant with God, now you and I can be grafted into that covenant. That's how he pays for our fines. So it, it's not what most people are led to believe Christ is paying for. He does pay for our sins, but he's paying for the sins of the house of Israel. He's not putting himself as atonement for you in every situation. And that's why people don't understand what Yeshua did. This woman specifically, if you watch the video, if you know what I'm talking about, I'm not going to name names, but a lot of you know uh, who I'm talking about. And if you watch this video, 
she's not understanding this concept at all. And she's thinking that Yeshua is putting himself in for atonement for you. And that's not exactly what he's doing. Uh, this house to do with the house of Israel and the fines and penalties due to them and how they needed to be cleansed in order that Israel could be brought back into covenant and you can therefore be grafted into that covenant. So please go watch those. Um, I really think it helps you understand because people get hung up with things like, again, I, I mentioned reading Ezekiel 18 uh, and you should do that, but people get hung up sometimes with Ezekiel 18 about how can Yeshua pay for this then since somebody can't stand in for another. That's not what we're talking about. That's not what Yeshua did. And I like how it talks about this specifically in Psalms of Solomon 18 um, because that's what he did. He cleansed the house of Israel. He paid for those fines, which is something that he can do since he was part of the covenant. Um, again, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this. I had a conversation with somebody not too long ago who wasn't quite understanding um, how some of the things in the covenant played out. And here's, here's where I am at with Yeshua and the covenant on Sinai. Um, I believe that the covenant on Sinai was always between Yeshua and the people. The covenant was Yeshua and the people. Moses was the mediator of that covenant. And then God ordained this all to happen. So it starts to bring it a little bit more close to home when you realize that Yeshua was part of that covenant on Mount Sinai. Now maybe you don't want to throw that in the trash can so quickly. Uh, but I truly believe that Yeshua was there. That the covenant was with him. And that's why he's paying these fines for the house of Israel because of what they did in that covenant that was between him and them. Uh, so anyways, we could spend hours talking about that. And if you want to know more privately, uh, feel free to email me or message me. I'd be happy to talk about it with you. Um, but I really believe that Yeshua was in that original covenant, that it was between Yeshua and the people, and that it was God's covenant still, kind of like, kind of like, it's still not the best example but kind of like when you get married at a courthouse, right? You, you have your wife and then you have your husband and the covenant between you two, but it's ordained by the judge. It's made official by the judge. I think the most high was the judge in, in that covenant. Like it's his, right? In a sense, but it's also Yeshua's and the people's. Um, anyways, not the best example, but I believe in a nutshell, that's what's going on with the Sinai covenant. And when you understand that, and when you read the scriptures with that idea in mind, uh, it changes a lot of stuff, uh, especially from the doctrine we were all originally taught. But I digress. Let's get back to the study. I want to read this one more time. Verse six, may God cleanse Israel for the day of mercy with blessing for the day of election when he brings up his anointed one. That's Yeshua. Yeshua cleansed the house of Israel. Yeshua is the anointed one. And right before this, it talks about a unique firstborn son. Come on. Come on. Who are we talking about here? Um, anyways, very interesting. And I'm glad that it specifically mentions this in the Psalms of Solomon. Blessed are those who are born in those days to see the good things of the Lord, which he will do for the coming generation. Man, such a blessing. I mean, I can't, I can't describe to you what, what an enormous blessing and what an enormous weight is going to be lifted off my shoulders, all of our shoulders, if Yeshua, you know, pardons us and lets us into the kingdom. Wow. And then our kids get to grow up in that world? Come on, man. You, like, I feel bad for my kids that they might have to grow up in this crappy world. Like, I, I get sad about that. I see them and they're just so, so pure and innocent and kind. And I just know what they're going to have to go through in this world. And I just don't want them to go through it. I don't want them to go through the same stuff 
that I had to go through. I don't want them to have to find the hard path. I don't want them to get hurt and feel pain and get just, I don't know, like for lack of a better term, crapped on by this really, really bad world. Pardon my language there, but I feel really bad that my kids have to grow up in this horrible, horrible world. And what an amazing blessing to have kids grow up in that kingdom, in that world. They will have no idea how blessed they are. I mean, and again, I I wish I was just born into that kingdom. That would be nice. Didn't have to go through all this that I had to go through. Didn't have to put up with this horrible, evil, wicked world. Man, that would be amazing. But I do think the people that have gone through this world and then enter into that world will have, they'll probably have a special understanding all of their own, uh, which is really cool to think about, you know. But at the end of the day, that's the kingdom I want my kids to grow up in. And it hurts my heart sometimes to think about what they're going to have to go through in this world if. I'm wrong about where we are at in history. Because, uh, I mean, again, I can't say where we are 100% yet. I can't say, oh, I know for a fact we're in, we're in this section of the Bible. Now, I've speculated where I think we might be in the Revelation series we're going through on Shabbat. If you haven't followed that, um, I speculate on that. But I, I can't be 100% sure. You know, I can't know that for sure. Not yet. Uh, and if I'm wrong... And if my kids have to grow up in this world, it really stinks. It really stinks that they're going to have to grow up in this world because it ain't getting any better. And it's way worse than when I grew up. Way worse. I, I mean, way worse. No other way to put it. Um, and it's, it's getting worse and worse by the day. And I, just, I feel really bad for the kids that are going to have to grow up in this world if if our Messiah is not coming back real soon. I feel really bad for them. But it will truly be a blessing for all the kids that get to be born into that kingdom. Ah, man. What an amazing blessing to be born into that kingdom. All right. Um, let's, do, let's read verse 7 one more time. Blessed are those who are born in those days to see the good things of the Lord, which he will do for the coming generation. Under the rod of discipline of the anointed one of the Lord, in the fear of his God, in the wisdom of spirit and righteousness and strength. Man, that's going to that's gonna be a good time. Now, I want you to pay attention because it says under the rod of discipline of, of the anointed one. Something awful familiar is spoken in the Gospels. Let's, let me see if I can find it. I, I want to say it's in Matthew 13, but I'm not 100% sure. Let me find it real quick. Um, I think I might even mention it in Revelation. All right. All right, let's, let's start. Uh, okay, let's, here's a couple of references in Revelation. Speaking of Yeshua, and he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my father. That's talking about Yeshua ruling with a rod of iron. Then it talks again. Here's Revelation 19, 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the almighty. Now, this sounds bad to a lot of people who don't understand, but it's a good thing that he's ruling with an, a rod of iron. Um, it sounds harsh, but the fear of God is good. We know from Proverbs that the fear of God is the only way we depart from evil. So the fear of God's good. Again, despite nobody in mainstream Christianity wanting or fearing God at all. They don't want to fear God. They don't want a God that you have to fear. But the fear of God is what keeps us from doing evil. We know this from scripture. So that's a good thing. And ruling with a rod of iron is also a good thing. If this world was ruled with a rod of iron, it wouldn't be such a horrible place that it is now. 
everybody just automatically jumps to the worst thing when thinking about ruling with a rod of iron. And they think like, oh, Hitler ruled with a, a rod of iron. That's not what we're talking about. No. Imagine ruling with a rod of iron, but in a good, righteous, noble, fair way. Again, something the world's never seen, so it's hard for us to comprehend. The world has never seen that. We have never had a good ruler. I'm sorry, I don't care who you voted for. I don't care who you've liked in history. We have never, no matter what country you're in, we've never had a good ruler. We haven't. We don't know what that's like. We haven't seen it. But this will be ruling with a rod of iron in a righteous, fair, and just way. And that is going to be amazing. That's going to be good. But people just don't understand that. But either way, we're clearly talking about Yeshua here. To, in the scriptures, it tells us that he is going to rule with a rod of iron. And this says that the unique born son of God, anointed one, will rule with a rod of iron. I mean, it doesn't say son of God. You know, we have to infer that. But again, all these people that are like, oh, well, where does God say he's going to send his son? You know, all over scripture, if you're of God, you're his son. Satan is God's son. The angels are sons of God. Yeshua is a son of God, right? So all these people questioning, oh, it never says the son of God's going to show up. Well, sons of God showed up a long time ago and Jesus showed up and a bunch of sons of God have been on this earth, right? And we are shooting for becoming sons of God. That is our goal. Sons and daughters of the most high. That's what we want to be. So when these people get hung up on, oh, well, it does, God doesn't say he's going to send his son. Well, he's sending somebody and the somebody that he's sending is most likely a son of God, a messenger of God. So again, people get caught up on that and they shouldn't because it's really easily solved with just a little bit of common sense thinking in scripture. All right. Anyways. Under the rod of discipline of the anointed one of the Lord, that's Yeshua, in the fear of his God, because fear of God is necessary. And if you don't have it, well, when you finally get it, it's probably not going to be a good time for you. Because um, a lot of the people that claim to love and worship God don't fear him at all and are not staying away from things that he considers evil. And the fear of God might get struck into them a little bit too late. We want it earlier rather than later. Remember, whole duty of man, fear God, numero uno, and keep his commandments. And keep his commandments. In the wisdom of spirit and righteousness and strength. That's all talking about Yeshua. You cannot get around that. That is all for sure talking about Yeshua. To direct men in works of righteousness by the fear of God. To establish them all before the Lord. If you don't like God's commandments, well, sucks. Because you're going to, if you're in that kingdom, you're going to be following them. You will be following God's commandments in the kingdom that Yeshua is running. Zero question. That's a scriptural concept. So all these people that really don't like God's commandments, I don't think they're going to like God's kingdom very much. And there's a good chance they're not going to be there anyways. But all these people that don't seem to like God's commandments, Jesus leads us in God's commandments. So better get used to it now. Better start practicing. All right. To direct men in works of righteousness, that's God's works, that's obedience to God, by the fear of God, which is required, to establish us before the Most High. That says it all right there. And that's exactly talking about Jesus. The Jesus of the Bible. Maybe not the Jesus that man's doctrine has created, but the Jesus that's in the Bible, that's definitely talking about him. Verse 10. A good generation in the fear of God in the days of mercy. Can't wait for that. Great is our God of glorious. Uh, great is our God and of glorious dwelling in the highest places. I'll mean to that. Who appointed stars in course for occasion of times from day 
today. And they did not transgress from the way that you commanded them. All right. Now, um, if we're talking about literal stars here, and I think we are, uh, the Bible describes angels, some types of angels as stars, you know, the actual stars. And it, it talks heavily in the first book of Enoch about the luminaries, stars, sun, moon, how they all work. Um, and spoiler alert, they actually work how the book Enoch says and not how we're being told in mainstream science, NASA. Remember, claiming to be wise, they became fools. Uh, and that they did. So biblical cosmology is not what we were taught in school, but it works and makes far more sense than what we were actually taught if you take a step back. If you try to understand how God ordained things and then you look at the way that you were taught in school, they don't match up. And God's way makes a whole heck of a lot more sense. A whole lot more sense. So when you talk about this, how they did not transgress the way that God commanded them and that they were for signs, for occasions, for seasons from day to day. I, again, find it incredibly interesting that in all of documented human history, the luminaries and the stars have worked the exact same way. They have never changed. The constellations didn't shift. They all still do the same thing every year. And we're talking about Thousands of years ago, we have documented proof that they were doing exactly what they're doing today. Now, when we look at what science teaches us, they say the universe is expanding. Everything's going further and further and further apart, right? And then on top of that, just in our solar system, just in our solar system, the earth spins a thousand miles an hour at the equator. That's what they say, which doesn't make any sense at all. But not only is it spinning a thousand miles, it is revolving around the sun at 50,000 miles an hour-ish. 50,000 miles an hour. And the whole, the whole wing of our solar system, our galaxy is what they say, our little wing that we're on is rotating 500,000 miles an hour. So 1,000, 50,000, and half a million miles an hour and all of this is expanding away from each other, you would think that some of the constellations might have changed a little bit over the last few thousand years. I mean, logically. Just saying. Think about it. I, if you're new to this, if you're brand new to this thought, think about it. It makes no sense. But NASA's a great way to launder... 20 to $50 billion a year. Have you ever watched a movie? Ever watched a movie from Hollywood? Doesn't, doesn't even matter. Any space movie. Any space movie. How about, uh, what's that one with, uh, I think, Matthew McConaughey? I used to love it back in the day when I was a brand new Christian. Now I'm starting to see what they were getting at. But it was, um, oh man, it's going to drive me crazy. I haven't seen it in a really long time. So Matthew McConaughey, and he went up into space, and then Interstellar. Thank you, Tracy. Interstellar. Yes, that's the one. So think about that movie. Did you guys watch that movie? Did you see how crazy all the graphics were? And I'm talking, you know, that's a decade ago. Decade ago. All the graphics that they had. The average budget for a Hollywood movie is 50 to $150 million dollars. 50 to 150 million, and they can make everything look real. Did you know that NASA's budget is 55 million a day? A day. That's how much they take in taxpayer money. 55 million a day. Also, there's articles about how NASA and their Goddard Space Station uh, Research Center works with Hollywood all the time. They have one of the largest movie sets in the United States at NASA. I mean, I'm just saying. Also, all the people that have found weird, strange anomalies in these live stream space NASA things. Come on. Go watch some videos from Founded Earth Brothers. If you're brand new to this, Founded Earth Brothers on YouTube is the best starting point for you. Um, but what God says in the Bible 
is not what we were taught in school. That's my main point here. And what God says in the Bible makes a whole lot more sense than what we were actually taught in school. Um, nothing that we're taught out here logically makes any sense whatsoever when you take a step out of what you're taught and really critically think about it. Uh, anyways, I believe God. And I don't care if that makes me look like a fool because, again, claiming to be wise, they became fools. The foolishness of men. Astounding. Right? What else does it say in the scriptures? Anyone? Bueller? It says that people claiming to be wise, they became fools. Among other things. Sorry, I got, I got brain twisted there for a second. There was somewhere else I was going with that. But it says that the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. That's where I was going. It came back to me. The wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. So all these people out there that think, oh, look how much we know. Look at all this science we have. Look at all these machines we've built. I don't care. We're going to look like idiots to them. They think we're the dumb ones. Don't care. I believe the Bible. And you got to not care. You really, if, if you want to have a good, solid walk on this earth in the scriptures, the world's going to hate you and think you are a moron. And you have to be okay with that. Because God doesn't like the people pleasers. I'm not talking about being nice to people or, you know, trying to plant seeds. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about you just bending over to the world because you don't want them to think you're a fool or you don't want to look bad. Do you know what crap I have gotten for posting videos about biblical cosmology? It's been a while since I've posted one, but go look at some of the comments on there. I'm not exactly met with open arms. My face is floating around all the internet with people talking about what a big dumb idiot I am. Oh well, it's the price I have to pay for speaking the truth, right? But it talks in the Apocrypha about how those people uh, are not going to get the last laugh. So anyways, you're going to have to be okay with it. You just, you just need to not care. You just need to say, you know what? They're not going to like me. They're going to think I'm an idiot. Whatever. That's their problem. Takes a lot of people a long time to get there. You know, it took me a long time to get there where I where I didn't care that these people were making fun of me or thinking how, how foolish I am or whatever. I know what I know and I trust God. So that's what I'm sticking with. And that's what I'm going to go for. And I hope that you guys do the exact same thing, right? Even if we don't agree on everything, that's fine. It's fine if we don't agree on everything. But I would rather look like a fool to the rest of the world and be standing right next to Yeshua than have all these other people like me, but I'm out there with them about to go to a place that I don't want to go to. Anyways. Um, verse 12. Who appointed stars in course for occasions of times from days to days. And they did not transgress from the way that you commanded them. No, they didn't. Those stars are all still doing the exact same thing. Their way is in the fear of God each day, from the day God created them until eternity. That's a long time, and I believe it. And they were not led astray from the day he created them. They were not removed from their ways from ancient generations. No, they weren't. And this was written in an ancient generation. He's talking about how it was the same in ancient generations, in his time, and now his generation is ancient to us, and it is still the same. If what we were taught in school is true, this wouldn't be. It would be impossible for this to be true, and yet it is. Again, use your brain, even if the rest of the world thinks you're not. Yeah, exactly, Jen. Nothing new under the sun. All right, um... One more time, verse 14. And they were not led astray from the day he created them. They were not removed from their ways from ancient generations unless God commanded them by the command of his servants. Boom. 
that is the end of uh, Psalms of Solomon. I am sad that we wrapped up this study. But I hope you could see what we've been talking about the last few chapters, how it's so obviously talking about our Messiah. I mean, there's so much scriptural evidence. I'm not talking about the Apocrypha, but there's so much scriptural evidence that what it was saying in the Apocrypha is absolutely true in the time of Yeshua. Um, anyways, for those of you that weren't with me in the beginning of this, um, we are going to start the Shepherd of Hermas next week. It's a big study. We'll probably be in it for a while. I would like to do First Enoch. That's also going to be a really big study. So uh, I don't know, but I, I really think um, most people have come around to First Enoch. I know a lot of you have read it. Um, but I know a lot of you have not read The Shepherd of Hermas. So, and, and The Shepherd of Hermas is equally valuable in our Christian walk. So uh, we're going to study The Shepherd of Hermas starting next Tuesday, Wednesday on YouTube. Uh, and we're going to be we're going to be going through that. Um, I really suggest you get a copy to follow along if you can. Uh, like I said, I recommend this one. The Apostolic Fathers, the Rick Brandon translation, it's pretty cheap. You can probably find free PDFs online of The Shepherd of Hermes. I believe it's also on the Lost Books Apocrypha app, which is on iPhone, probably also on Android. Um, but uh, you can get free copies online, so you don't have to get the book copy. I just like paper copies of stuff. Uh, and if you were going to get one, the Rick Brandon translation is good. There's a lot of other stuff in here that you should read too. Uh, I mean, this book has the Didache. You should read that. This has the second epistle of Clement. You should absolutely read that. Um, it's got uh, the, the letters to Polycarp uh, are really good too. That was John's uh, uh, disciple. Um, the letters from Ignatius, they're okay. Um I mean, he's very Pauline in his writing and has a lot of confusing stuff. Him and Barnabas, both. Um, but still, there's some interesting stuff in there as well. But this book has a lot of stuff you should read if you haven't read it before. And because I know that less of you had read The Shepherd of Hermes than have actually read First Enoch, we're going to do The Shepherd of Hermes for the foreseeable future. Uh, and then one day I'd like to get into a first Enoch study because that's another really good one. It's been a while since I've even read it. You know, I pick through it here and there, uh, to find verses that I, I recall. Um, but I haven't like sat down and read all the way through it in a while. So I'll probably do that in my free time here coming soon. What little free time I seem to have these days. But, uh, thank you guys for doing this study with me again. This coming Thursday night on TikTok, I'll be live streaming with Leaving Churchianity. Hope you guys can make that. It'll be on my YouTube if you can't uh, the following night. Uh, and then we're still in Revelation on Shabbat. So I hope you guys can come and study Revelation with me. Uh, that one's been a really good study, I think. Um, anyways, uh, if you guys have any questions, um, I'll hang out with you guys here in the chat for a few minutes. Um, I made my own copy of Enoch by hand. Nice. That's cool. I like that. Uh, it's good, good to good to do that. Um, headline: Shalom and love, family. Yes, you too, Tiffany. Thank you. Uh, Truth unedited just posted a video about to watch, and that's the headline. What the Shepherd of Hermes? It is Truth unedited doing something about uh, the Shepherd of Hermes. That'd be cool. I hope he does. Um, anyways, though, we're going to be doing our own study of the Shepherd of Hermes, and it's going to be great. Uh, oh, the heifers. Uh, you, interesting stuff going on with that. Um, anyways, though, um, we might be able to blow through the first section of the Shepherd of Hermes pretty quick. Um, you know, all the, uh, the, the parables, the towers, that stuff. It's all very interesting. Um, and there, there's some spiritual stuff to be gotten in that. But we might be able to get through that section quick. I, I'm going to try to because I really, really, really like the second section of the Shepherd of Hermes the best uh, when it starts getting into talking about the commandments. That is like invaluable information. But anyways, I'm rambling. I hope you guys can be here with me uh, next week when we start the Shepherd of Hermes. Uh, if you guys need anything in the meantime, feel free to reach out to me, sheepdogministries.hotmail.com. Or any other way you guys want to reach out, uh, phone call, 
uh, comment on one of the videos, whatever. I try to try to keep up with all my comments as best as I can. Uh, John, the Shepherd of Hermas is a uh, first century, early second century Christian writing from one of the early church fathers, and it's just an amazing first century Christian writing. It really shows, in my opinion, the heart of the first churches, the the actual first churches that were established. Um, because it's not what people were led to believe it was. It was walking in the fear of God. It was keeping his commandments. It was it was literally trying to be like Jesus. Um, and that's not what the churches these days think it was. And that's certainly not what they teach. So uh, I think the Shepherd of Hermits really goes a long way to showing the heart of the first century churches, like where they were at with everything. And it's just, like I said, invaluable information about how we should, as believers, walk out our life. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff in the Shepherd of Hermes. Um, so anyways, I hope you can be with me. And you guys, if you want to self-study, get a free copy. Get the Apostolic Fathers by Rick Brandon. Study up. Read it. Pre-read. Uh, you will not be disappointed with your read. I guarantee it. Uh, but anyways... Uh, it looks like I don't have too many other comments here. So we can talk about the Shepherd Hermes next week when we begin the study. Hope you guys can do that with me. Um, and then I hope to see you Thursday and on Shabbat. So shalom and thank you to all of you. Um, thank you for the study. Looking forward to Thursday. Me too. I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, all right, you guys. Thank you. If you need anything, you know how to get a hold of me. But uh, may the Most High bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and lift up his countenance upon each and every one of you in the name of our Messiah, Yeshua. Um, I love you guys. I really hope you have a good rest of your week. Um, so far, my week's been pretty good. So we're prayers, prayers that that keeps up for all of us. But uh, if you need anything, like I said, reach out to me. But I'll see you guys in two days. And then uh, I'll see you on Shabbat. Uh, so love you guys. And if you need anything, just reach out to me, okay? I'll talk to you soon.